raise your hand if you've ever had to buy a baby product for your own child, for a niece or nephew, for even a friend's baby. Okay, great. So I have a two and a half year old and nieces and nephews and friends with babies. And I found the process of buying baby products to be a really overwhelming experience. The number of products are endless. Let's take a baby swaddle, for example. When I was searching for a swaddle, I had to figure out if I wanted a traditional swaddle blanket or one of the new contraptions. And then I had to figure out what type of fabric I wanted and if I wanted one with Velcro or one that zipped, or if I wanted one to swaddle with arms up or arms down, or if I wanted one with a weight. And I would find myself searching for swaddle after swaddle after swaddle after swaddle after swaddle. And at some point, I just had to stop and ask myself, how do you know? How do you know which one to buy? And so I did what any good mom or aunt or friend would do, and I consulted Google and mommy influencers and blogged and top rated product lists and consumer reviews. And with all of that information, I would try to determine which product worked the best for the most number of children. What I was really searching for was a product that had been vetted and verified by the most number of people as being the best. And this is what sales and marketing experts refer to as a consensus. So let's go with another example, and hopefully this one will pull in everybody else. How many of you have bought toothpaste? And I really hope everybody is raising their hand at this point because everybody should be brushing their teeth. So buying toothpaste is also a very overwhelming experience. When you're standing the, in the aisle, it's basically floor to ceiling shelves of toothpaste of different brands and colors and flavors, all with the information you need to make your decision printed on a box that's no wider than the size of your hand. So let's go with white knee toothpaste because that should help focus our efforts, right? Nope. As you stand in the aisle, you realize that there's regular whitening, bright whitening, gentle whitening, charcoal whitening, hydrogen peroxide whitening, natural or organic based whitening. And then at some point you find yourself looking at a blue light at home whitening kit, which isn't even toothpaste, but you went down a whitening rabbit hole and you're farther than when you even started. And so at that point you stand in the aisle and ask yourself, how do you know? How do you know which one you should choose? Well, my husband has a very specific way of purchasing toothpaste. So we only buy toothpaste that has the stamp of the American Dental Association on it. It surprisingly cuts down on the number of options, but to us, if the American Dental Association says it's good to go, then our teeth should be okay. We view the American Dental Association as having authority when it comes to the health of our teeth. And we view it as having this authority because it's a collection or a consensus that uses standards to drive its toothpaste recommendations. And this is a different type of consensus than with the baby swaddle example. The American Dental Association represents what I would like to call an authoritative consensus. Now let's go with one more example. How many of you have been on Oversight.gov and been overwhelmed by the number of reports that are now available on that site, or even on PandemicOversight.gov? By the number of recommendations, open recommendations, closed recommendations, significant recommendations, recommendations with monetary value. And now there are eight different types of report categories for people to filter through, including everybody's favorite catch-all of other. So I can imagine a program manager or a health staffer or a journalist going to oversight.gov or even pandemicoversight.gov, trying to find information on a program or an internal control or insert some other government challenge and be really overwhelmed in asking themselves, how do you know? How do you know where to even begin? Now, don't get me wrong. I love oversight.gov and I love pandemicoversight.gov. And I would classify myself as a power user because I'm on these sites on a weekly, if not daily basis. And just to, the creation of oversight.gov was a tremendous collaborative effort by this community. But with the expansion of our oversight work and our responsibilities and the cross-cutting nature of federal programs, 
we as a community need to ask ourselves, what's next? In a time when the world has more information and more opinions than any one individual can process, we as independent watchdogs have a duty to provide credible, fact-checked, quality information and solutions. But we also need to be able to market our work and those products in a manner, in a manner that reaches our audience with the message of, you can trust us because they can. I would argue that Siggy and the Oversight Community has the ability to leverage our own individual authority as a credible source and magnify that authority through consensus, leveraging a dual faceted marketing approach of an authoritative consensus, much like the American Dental Association. It is this authoritative consensus that allows us to realize the collective power of the oversight community. So how do we set up this collective power, you ask? Well, I've got four things to get us started. Number one, clustering. One marketing technique used to establish consensus is called clustering. And the goal of this technique is to help consumers retain information in short-term memory. Now, I'm sure some of you can surmise using the name, but clustering involves grouping related content. And this is something that we've been working through at the PRAC as we think through how to display information on our website. We have a very similar model to oversight.gov where we have a centralized repository of information and reports. But as we think through the display of the information, it's about figuring out how to structure those reports in our website in a manner that instead of relying upon a reader to use the keyword search function to filter through 6,000 plus recommendations, that reader would be able to find information about programs or controls or to various topics or government challenges already pre-populated for them in a meaningful way. And this is just the start of creating our collective power. So it brings us to number two, cross-cutting work. So I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that program managers from the Department of Justice are probably not reading reports about the National Science Foundation or program managers at the General Services Administration are probably not reading reports about the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I can fully appreciate that federal agencies have their own programs and their own challenges, but I would argue that federal agencies have more in common when it comes to program implementation than people realize, and that the recommendation of one OIG could also be applicable to another agency. So in addition to grouping together our individual reports on oversight.gov, how do we leverage the work and the subject matter expertise of the entire oversight community? The next element of clustering involves creating a common language and a shared message around a problem and a solution. It is the, through the development of cross-cutting work that we can establish a common language and a shared message. Now, the oversight community has already conducted some cross-cutting work, such as the issuance of our top management challenges report or the top pandemic challenges report. And earlier this year, six OIGs issued a report on COVID-19 testing efforts across six different federal programs. And they did this all with the intent of providing information to policymakers that would help improve testing for Americans. In a time when it was easy to get lost in the amount of information related to COVID-19 testing, these OIGs created a common language and a shared message across programs into one report that instead of requiring stakeholders to read six different reports and draw their own conclusions, these OIGs use the consolidation of this information in one spot to identify key insights across all six of these programs. Collective power. And in another example, three OIGs consolidated their work across 22 different oversight reports into one capping report to highlight key challenges and issues facing correctional and detention facilities 
regardless of the parent agency. And the PRAC will continue to conduct cross-cutting work, but this is really just the beginning because I know that this community has a lot more going on than just conducting pandemic oversight work. So can you imagine doing cross-cutting work where we create a common language and a shared message around challenges facing the acquisition for workforce or on challenges implementing more equitable federal programs or on creating and setting up enterprise risk management structures using best practices and lessons learned from across the government. Now that would be some collective power. Number three, add in state and local oversight entities to expand our reach and expand our collective power. Federal assistance spending now exceeds federal contract spending annually, and a good chunk of that money goes to state and local governments. But the good news with this is that we already have built-in partners who are conducting oversight at those levels. And these built-in partners conduct more than just federal assistance oversight. They look at IT security and management, internal controls, enterprise risk management, and so much more. So by intentionally engaging with state and local oversight entities in a meaningful way, we can take our reach from more than 70 federal OIGs to hundreds of oversight entities who all conduct work with similar standards, expanding our collective power. So before I started my job at the PRAC, truth be told, I had never read a state or local oversight report. Part of that may have been circumstantial, but I think a large part of it was that I didn't understand the value of these reports. So I went from basically never having read a report issued by a state or local oversight entity to stalking out any state or local oversight report related to the pandemic in an effort to manually develop a centralized repository for the PRAC's website. Now, I know what you're asking at this point because if we're adding in more reports and more recommendations, isn't this going in the wrong direction? And the answer to that would be yes. So in order to make this work effectively, we can and should engage state and local oversight entities in our clustering and our cross-cutting work efforts. Can you imagine the utility of a website where a program manager from the Department of Agriculture with just the click of a button can view all oversight products issued by USDA OIG as and well as state and local oversight entities related to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program? Or can you imagine the Department of Education OIG and three to four state auditor's offices doing a cross-cutting project that looks at federal education spending within those states? It's like having supplemental site visit teams who already understand the complexity of the states where they operate. Now that would be collective power. So now we've reached number four, which is get the word out. So now that we've established our collective oversight community, we have to get the word out because we could issue all of these new resources and all of these new reports. And if nobody knows about them, then we can't reach our full potential. But the cool thing about expanding our oversight community, we've now expanded our outreach possibilities. So we, at this point, we are able to utilize the social media megaphone of more than 70 different federal OIGs and state and local oversight entities in order to increase traffic and the number of eyes on our work. Collective power. Now, I realize that my four easy steps may not be so easy, but it'll be worth it. As with the American Dental Association being the trusted authority for how my family selects its toothpaste, wouldn't it be incredible if federal program managers viewed SIGI and the oversight community with a similar trusted authority? Now that would be some collective power.